Hi everyone, welcome back to Pages Glow, and today I'm going to be reading to you the short story, Makisha in Time, by Rachel K. Jones. Now this short story is incredibly interesting, and as soon as I read it, I was very intrigued. It's about this girl named Makisha, and about her matriarch life. Basically, she's pulled from the present at any given time, and she'll be sent to live lifetimes scattered through the past. And once she dies in those lifetimes, she'll return right back to her age and the moment that she first left in. Now, her exploits in the past are so fascinating, and honestly, they feel real. It's a fantastic story about erasure and triumph, and honestly, it's one that I've been thinking about all week. This story is incredibly interesting because not only does it talk about all of Makisha's adventures but it also talks about her frustration because she's so intent on the lifetime that she's living in the past that most of the time she isn't able to focus on her actual life or her present and she feels extremely annoyed because when she looks back to see what um, people found about her past lifetime most of the time her work is covered up by men specifically white men and it's extremely frustrating So not only is the story incredibly interesting from a sci-fi perspective, it's also really interesting from a historical standpoint because it is probably true that there were many women who did things and rather than being credited for their work, men took the credit. In fact, there have been tons of times when this has happened and it's really important to call them out and Rachel K. Jones does a beautiful job of that. Also, this story is really interesting because... Makisha, the protagonist, isn't interested in the present anymore. She's more interested in what's happening in the past, which normally isn't a good thing because that's not her real life. And if she gets rid of her actual life, then she can't just go back like she could with past lives. This is definitely an interesting book, and I really wish that this story was more popular. Now, Rachel K. Jones is... A very interesting person but unfortunately I could not find much information about her. I do know that she grew up in various cities across Europe and North America and picked up six languages and she acquired several degrees in the arts and scientists. Now she writes speculative fiction in Oregon. She is a World Fantasy Award nominee and a Tip Tree Award honoree. Her fiction has appeared in dozens of venues worldwide including multiple years best anthologies, Lightspeed Magazine, Beneath Seasless Skies, Strange Horizons, and all four Escape Artists podcasts. You can also follow her at Twitter at A. Rachel K. Jones. Without further ado, let's get on with the story. Makisha in Time by Rachel K. Jones Makisha has always been able to bend the fourth dimension, but no one will believe her. She has been a soldier, a sheriff, a pilot, a prophet, a poet, a ninja, a nun, a conductor of trains and symphonies, a cordwainer, a comedian, a carpetbagger, a troubadour, a queen, and a receptionist. She has shot arrows, guns, and cannons. She speaks an extinct Ethiopian dialect with perfect accent. She knows a recipe for mead that is measured in oryx horns, and with a katana, she is deadly. Her jumps happen intermittently. She will be yanked from the present without warning and live a whole lifetime in the past. When she dies, she returns right back to where she left, restored to a younger age. It usually happens when she is deep in conversation with her boss or arguing with her mother-in-law or during a book club meeting, just when it's her turn to speak. One moment, Makisha is firmly grounded in the timeline of her birth and the next she is elsewhere else when. Makisha has seen the sun rise over prehistoric shores where the ocean writhed with soft slimy things that bore the promise of dung beetles, Archaeopteryx, and Edgar Allan Poe. She has seen the sun set over long forgotten empires. When Makisha skims a map of the continent, she sees a fractured Pangaea. She never knows where she will jump next or how long she will stay but she is never afraid. 
but Keisha has been doing this all her life. The hardest part is coming back. Once, when she was 12, she was slouched in the pew at church when she felt the past tug. Makisha found herself floundering in the rolling ocean of the Mediterranean, only to be saved by Moorish pirates who hauled her aboard in the nick of time. At first, the bewildered men and women treasured their catch as a mascot and a good luck charm. Later, after nearly 10 years of fine sea craft and fearless warfare, they made her captain of the ship. Makisha took to piracy like sheet music. She could climb ropes and hold her grog with the best sailors. And even after losing an eye in a gunpowder explosion, she never once wept or wished herself home. The day came when, at the Pasha's command, she set sail to intercept Spanish invaders in Ottoman waters. It was a hot night when they sighted the lanterns of the enemy shuddering on the waves. Makisha's crew pulled their ship astern the enemy's vessel in the dark and fog after midnight. She gave the order, charge, with her deep voice booming through the mists, echoed by the shouts of her pirates as they swung on ropes over the sliver of ocean between the ships. And suddenly, an explosion and a pinching sensation in her midriff, and she was twelve again in the church pew, staring at her soft palms through two perfect eyes. That was when she finally wept, so loud and hard that the reverend stopped his sermon to scold her. Her father grounded her for a week for disturbing the service like that. People often get angry with Makisha when she returns from her jumps. She cannot control her confusion, the way the room spins like she is drunk, and how for days and weeks afterwards she cannot settle back into who she was, because the truth is, she isn't the same. Each time she returns from the past, she carries another lifetime nestled within her like the shell of a matryoshka doll. Once, after the fall of the Roman Empire, she joined a peasant uprising in Bavaria, and charging quickly led from fiefdom to fiefdom, their band pushed back the warlords to the foothills of the Alps. Those who survived sued for peace, for mercy, begged her not to raise their fields, pledged fealty to her. As a condition of the peace, Makisha demanded their daughters in marriage to seal the political alliance. The little kings, far too afraid of the Bavarian queen, to shout their umbrage, conceded. They even attended the weddings, where Makisha stood with her sword piece tied at her waist and took the trembling hand of each Bavarian princess into her own. Once the wedding guest left, Makisha gathered her wives together in the throne room. Please, she said, help me. I need good women who I can trust to run this kingdom right. With their help, she established a stable state in those war-torn days. In time, all her wives made excellent deputies, ambassadors, sheriffs, and knights in her court. Makisha is especially broken up when her time in Bavaria was cut short by a bout of pneumonia. Many of her wives had grown to become dear friends of hers, and she wondered for months and months what had become of them and their children, and whether her fiefdom had lasted beyond her disappearance. She wanted to talk with her best friend, Philippa, to cry about it, but her phone calls were un unanswered, and so did her emails. Makisha could not remember when she had last spent time with her friends in the present. It was so hard to remember when her weeks and months were interspersed with whole lifetimes of friends and lovers and enemies. The present was a stop-motion film, a book interrupted mid-page and abandoned for years at a time. And when she did return, she carried with her another death. Makisha does not fear death anymore. She has died many times before, but she always awakens in the present, whole and alive, as before the jump. She does not know what would happen if she died in the present. Perhaps she would awaken in the future. She has never tried to find out. She cannot remember her first death. She probably died a hundred times in her infancy before she could even walk. Her jumps leave her in the wilderness or ocean more often than not, 
and when she does arrive near civilization, few will take pity on a strange abandoned child who cannot explain her presence. Lakeisha's mother has often joked about her appetite, how from the time she was a baby she ate like a person on verge of starvation. Her mother does not know how close this is to the truth. These days, Makisha wears her extra pounds with pride, knowing how often they have been her salvation. When Philippa finally returns her calls, she reams Makisha for slighting her all year, for the forgotten birthday, for the missed housewarming party. Makisha apologizes like she always does. They meet up in a person for a catch-up over coffee, and Makisha resolves that this time she'll be present for her friend. They are deep in conversation when she feels the tug, just as Philippa is admitting that she is afraid of what the future may bring. No, thinks Makisha, when she finds herself blinking on the edge of a sluggish river under the midday sun. Two white bulls have lifted their heads to stare at her, water dripping from their jowls. Makisha struggles to keep the conversation fresh in her head as she casts around for a quick way home. She chooses the river. It's hard that first time to make herself inhale, to still her windmilling arms, to let death take this matryoshka life so she can hasten back to the present. She has lost the thread of conversation away when she snaps back to Philippa's kitchen. Migraine, she explains, rubbing away the memory of the pain with her dizzy head, and Philippa feeds her two aspirin and some hot mint tea. Makisha resolves to do better next time, and eventually she does. On her first date with Carl, she strangles herself with strings from a lute of a height board. On their wedding day, she detours to a vast desert that she cannot place, which she escapes by crawling into a scorpion next. That death was painful. The next time she jumps, two days later on their honeymoon, she takes the time to learn the proper way to open her wrists with a sharp-edged rock. Her husband believes her when she says it's migraines. Makisha learned long ago to lie about the jumping. When she was just a child, she attempted to prove it to her mother by singing in Egyptian, but her mother just laughed at her and sent her to do the dishes. She received worse when she contradicted her history teachers. It was intolerable in sitting in school in the body of a child, but with the memories of innumerable lifetimes, while incomplete truths and half-truths and outright lies were written on the board. The adults called a conference about her attention-seeking behavior, and she learned to keep her mouth shut. It is a lesson she has never forgotten. All of it, the self-imposed silence, the suicides, the banishing of her fantastic past to the basement of her brain. These are the price of a normal life, of friendships and a marriage and a steady job. Mundane though it is, Makisha reminds herself that this life is different from the other ones. Irreplaceable, real. Still, she misses the past, which has always felt more real to her, where she has lived most of her life. She reads history books with a black marker and strikes out the bits that make her scuff. Then, with a red pen, she writes in the margins all the names she can recall, all the forgotten people who did not matter as much as George Washington and Louis the Sixteenth. When Carl asks, she explains how the world has always belonged to more than just the great men who were kings and presidents and generals, but for some reason, no one wrote it down. I think you're trying too hard, he says, and she hates the pity in his eyes when he holds up his hands and adds, but if it makes you happy, keep on with it. One day, as a surprise, her husband drove her four hours to a museum hosting an exhibit on medieval history. Makisha screeched and grabbed Carl's arm when she saw the posters at the entrance. Eighth century Bavaria. The memories were still so fresh. It had become five years ago, and dozens of self-murdered lives when she was torn from her thriving kingdom, from her deputy wives and her war band. Her face was composed as she purchased tickets, but she bounced on the balls of her feet all the way to the front of the line. It was for the first time that she had encountered any proof of a previous life. It felt like a dream. Euphoria flared in her breast 
when she peered into the glass cases that held familiar objects, old and worn but recognizable all the same, the proof of her long years of warfare and wisdom and canny leadership. A lead comb, most of its bristles missing, its colored enamel long ago worn to gray. It had belonged to Jute, probably. She had such fine, long hair, although she had kept it bound tightly for her work as a doctor. A thin gold ring she had given to dark-eyed Burchett in commemoration of her knighthood. And the best of all, a silver coin stamped with her own stylized profile, her broad nose jutting past her Bavarian war helm. There was a placard on the glass. Makisha read it thrice, each time a little slower, thinking perhaps she'd miss something, but no. It read, Early medieval objects from the court of a foreign king. He reigned in Bavaria for about 30 years. He? He? Makisha stormed back to the entrance, demanded to speak to the manager, with her vision swimming of violent red, her hands groping for pommel she could, did not wear anymore. It was wrong. It was all wrong, wrong, wrong. Her wives assigned a husband and stripped of their deputyship. Their legacy handed to a manufactured person. Carl begged her to tell him what was wrong. Makisha realized she was shouting oats in ancient German. And that was when she felt the familiar tug in her navel and found herself spinning back, further back than she had gone last time, until she found herself in an empty beach beneath the moon with a smooth craterless face. Her practiced eye spotted three ways to die on its first sweep, drowning, impaling, crushing. But then there was Jute's comb to consider, and that placard. When she gave up time to travel, she never thought she had surrendered her legacy, too. Makisha turned her back on the ocean and walked into the woods, busying herself with building a fire and assembling the tools she would need for her stay, however long it may be. She had learned to be resourceful and unafraid of the unfamiliar creaks and groans in the ferny green of the prehistoric underbrush. She chipped a cascade of sparks in her kindling, and that was when Makisha formed her plan. She is done with the present, with the endless self-murder, with the repression, suffocation, and low stakes. A woman unafraid to die can do anything she wants. A woman who can endure starvation and pain and deprivation can be her own boss, set her own agenda. The one thing she cannot do, however, is make them remember that she did it. Makisha is going to change that. No more suicides, then. Makisha embraces the jumps again. She is a boulder thrown into the waters of time. In 8th century Norway, she joins a band of Viking women. They are callous but good-humored, and they take her rage in stride as though she has nothing to explain. They give her a sword taller than she is, but she learns to swing it anyway, and to sing loudly into the wind, and one of the slain is buried with her hoard, sword folded on her breast. When she returns to the present, Makisha has work to do. She will stop mid-sentence, spin on her heel, and head for the books, leaving behind an astonished co-worker or friend or her husband calling after her. She pours everything into the search of her own past. One of her contacts sends her an email about a Moorish pirate, a woman making her name for herself among the Ottomans. A Spanish monk wrote about her last voyage, the way she leapt upon her prey like a gale in the night, how her battle cry chilled the blood. Makisha's grin holds until the part where the monk called her a whore. This is accepted without question as factual by the man writing the book. She is obsessed. Makisha almost loses her job because of her frequent forgetfulness, her accidental rudeness. Her desk is drowned in ancient maps. Her purse is crammed with reams of genealogies. In her living room, which has been lined from wall to wall with history books ever since Carl moved out, Makisha tries to count the lives stacked inside of her. There are so many of them, they are crowding to get out. She once tried to calculate how many years she had been alive. It was more than a thousand. And what did they amount to? Makisha is smeared across the timeline, but no one ever gets her quite right. Those who found the cairn of her Viking band assumed the swords and armor meant the graves of men, 
a folio of her sonnets, anonymous after much copying, are attributed to her assistant, Gregorio. You are building a fake identity, Philippa tells her one day, daring the towers of books and dried out markers to bring Mercutia some soup. They weren't any black women in ancient Athens. There weren't any in China. You need to come to grips with reality, my friend. They were too, Makisha says fiercely, proudly. I know they were. I know it. They were just erased, forgotten. I'm sure there were the few exceptions, but women did not just do the kind of things you're interested in. Makisha says, it doesn't matter what I do if people refuse to believe it. Her jumps are subdued after that. She returned to the written world for immortality. Makisha leaves love poetry on the walls of Aztec tombs in carefully colored Nahal pictograms. She presses cuneiform into the soft clay documenting the exploits of the proud woman whose names are written in red in the margins of her history books. She records the names of her lovers in careful Hanzi strokes with the horsehair bristles and bamboo books. Even these, the records she makes herself, do not survive intact. Sometimes the names are replaced by others deemed more remarkable, more credible, by the scribes who came after. Sometimes they are erased entirely. Mostly the books just fade into dust within time. She takes comfort knowing that she is not unique, that the chorus of lost voices is thundering. She is fading from the present. She forgets to eat between jumps, loses weight. Sometimes she starves to death when she lands in an isolated spot. Carl catches her one day at the mailbox. Sorry for just showing up. You haven't returned my calls, he explains, offering a sheaf of papers. Makisha accepts them and examines the red stamped first page of their divorce papers. You need to sign here, Carl says, pointing upside down at the bottom of the sheet. Also on the next page, please. The last word carries out a pleading note. Makisha notes his puffy eyes and a single white hair standing out in the black nest of his beard. How long has it been, she asks. It had been at least three lifetimes since he had left, but she isn't sure. Too long, he says. Please, I just need your signature so we can move on. She pats her pockets and finds a red pen. Makisha wonders how many decades or centuries until this signature is also altered or lost or purposely erased, but she touches pen to paper anyway. Halfway through her signature, she spends 26 years sleeping under the stars with the aborigines, and when she comes back, the rest of her name travels aimlessly down the sheet. Coral doesn't seem to notice. After he leaves, she escapes to India for a lifetime, where she ponders whether her time travel is a punishment or purgatory. When she returns to the present again, Makisha weeps like she did when she was 12, and her heart was breaking for her days as a pirate. Perhaps it was not the past that was yanking her away. Perhaps the present is crowding her out. And perhaps she has finally come to agree with the sentiment. In her living room, among the towers of blacked-out books, Makisha sees six ways to die from where she stands. Perhaps the way out is forward break through the last matriarchal shell like hatchling into the daylight but no no the self murders were never for herself not once makisha is resilient she is resourceful and she has been bending the fourth dimension all her life whether anyone recognizes it or not a woman who has been pushed her whole life will eventually learn to push back makisha reaches forward into the air with skillful fingers that have killed and healed and mastered the cello, she pulls the future toward her. She has not returned.